Ah, uh, people of Plymouth. Our scripture reading that is appointed for this day is uh, from the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He answered, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could not see anything. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and never ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, get, get up and go to the street called Straight and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this very moment, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument who I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. Now, this Bible story is a uh, pretty familiar one. Throughout history, this story is often referred to as the conversion of St. Paul. And indeed, if you check out the uh, painting on the cover of your bulletin, that's what it's titled, The Conversion of St. Paul. Now, as I read this story, I imagine it as a three-act play. Act one, we are introduced to Paul, who is still called Saul. He's educated, successful, he's been around the block a time or two, knows what is right and what is wrong, the ways of the world. And he is doing his part to keep the established order humming along, to keep the socio-economic religious system moving as it does. 
And so he is out to rein in all of those wackadoodle Jesus followers, stop them and their upside-down worldview from upsetting the apple cart of the status quo. Sure, he'll try and talk some sense into them, but usually arrest, torture, and death is the logical order of these things. Not his fault, really. Act two. Act two is a spectacular, the likes of a Justin Bieber concert at Wells Fargo Arena. Lights flashing, clashing cymbals, deafening music, disorienting stimulus of all the senses. Paul encounters the risen Christ. And he's thrown off of his horse. The scene ends in darkness. Act three. The sun rises in a garden. We focus in on a man slumped in a chair, so weak, still blinded, still disoriented. A stranger enters the scene. It's Ananias. And as Paul and Ananias talk, we see the life force returning to Paul's body. As Ananias takes his leave, something like scales fall from the eyes of Paul, he can see newly, differently. And the play ends as Paul strides out into the future, changed, transformed, converted. So let's call Act 1 status quo. Act 2, encounter. Act three, conversion. But before we go any further, we need to uh, check in. What is Paul's conversion about? What has he been converted from? And what is he converted to? And if you need a little help, Check out the first sentence of our scripture reading. What is Paul converted from? Okay, let me help you. He's breathing threats and murder. What's Paul converted from? Violence, you bet. Paul is converted from violence. And then here, you guys got to get this, okay? He's converted from violence to being the Paul who writes 1 Corinthians 13. What's he converted to? Yes. (laughs) That's what Paul's conversion is, from violence, from power and divide and conquer and harm, to an ethic of love, of wholeness, of shalom. And that's just the prelude to set us up for this. Plymouth Church, happy Immigrant Sunday. Each year, the United Church of Christ sets aside a weekend for churches to, uh, to focus in on, on migrant and immigrant issues, and, and this is our week. And I am speaking on this occasion because just five weeks ago, I accompanied our Plymouth delegation down to the Arizona-Mexico border for a week of intense Immigration, border, immersion. And it is at this point that I would like you to allow me to move 
from less sermon into more personal testimony. Because I had no idea when I left for our immersion trip that my experience would so mirror the three acts of the conversion of St. Paul. But it did. And that's what I would like to share with you today. And so, would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God. You are our strength. You are our Redeemer. Amen. Act 1. Status quo. Like Paul, I thought I had a pretty good idea of what I would encounter on our trip. After all, I was going to the Southwest. I was going home the land of my birth and the first half of my life. And as I recall my interaction with the border growing up, well, as a high schooler in the 1970s, we would just drive in and out of Tijuana on any given Saturday looking for a change of scenery and a new shopping mall. As a Texas history teacher in the 1980s, I planned lessons according to the harvest seasons and the migrant kids who would would flow in and out of my classroom according to what was being harvested at any given time. As a seminary student in the 1990s, I lived with the uh, Tohono O'odham people for a month never knowing exactly where I was because their sovereign land superseded any distinction between anything called Arizona or Mexico. I was on their native land. Migration has always been a part of creation. Just ask the geese that fly overhead. Just ask Jesus and his parents who migrated to Egypt and back again. Migration has always been a part of the created order. Now, I knew that things down at the border have changed a lot since I lived in those beloved borderlands since the early 2000s, when the border became a hot political issue. Drugs, of course, have always crossed the border, headed north. (laughs) And as long as we, in the United States, continue our insatiable demand for drugs, they're going to keep coming. And the only thing that increased border patrol and then a fence and then the wall, the only thing that those tactics have done in this arena is increase the violence and the power that the cartels wield. But we all know that. We also all know that immigrants aren't stealing our jobs. We all know that more than 90% of crimes in the United States are committed by U.S.-born citizens, not immigrants. And we all know that more than 70% of the guns seized at the border are heading south, not up here, not up north. So as I headed to Tucson for our immersion experience, I expected the status quo. I expected to be sad, but did not expect an encounter with the living Christ. Act two, encounter. 
Day one of our immersion, the Plymouth contingency is highly caffeinated thanks to George Dorsey. And we arrive at Good Shepherd United Church of Christ, bright and early. Pastor Randy welcomed us warmly and, and we gathered in the fellowship hall and he told us all about the itinerary that he had planned for us. Any questions, he asked? And I had one. I said, the last time that my brother was down south hiking in this area, he ran across a shaman, and the shaman told him that he was praying for the animals. So I asked Randy, what's up with that, praying for the animals? And Randy replied, yeah, the environment isn't talked about a lot, is it? And then he went on to tell us that the mess at the border isn't just disrupting human migration, it's also disrupting animal migration. Jaguars, Randy told us, are now almost extinct. The wall has cut them off from their traditional mating grounds. And then he went on. He said, you know the pollinator crisis that you all are hap, hap, uh, dealing with up in Iowa? And we all nodded. And he said, it's not just due to the chemicals. He said, a lot of pollinators migrate, including the monarch butterfly. A lot of the pollinators don't fly high enough to be able to get over the wall. And the ones who do fly up that high are getting zapped by all of the lights that are always shining on the wall. Flashing lights and crashing cymbals went off in my head. The immigration issue doesn't just affect people. It affects all of creation. And all of creation is being affected adversely down at our border. It was the following day that I was completely thrown from my horse. That was the day that I saw the wall for the first time in person. Pictures don't do it justice. It is beyond ugly. It is a hideous, violent, slashing gash cut into the beautiful, tender flesh of Mother Earth. Did, did any of you uh, see the musical Hades Town? The wall is never done, my children, my children. The wall is never done. Migration has always been a part of God's created order. And the way in which we are attempting to control it is to our detriment. When Paul heard the voice of God throw him off his horse, he heard the words, Why are you persecuting me? And when I was thrown off my horse, staring at that wall, speechless and in tears, I heard the voice of God, why are you persecuting me? God is always, always on the side of that which is denied wholeness and justice and peace. And so when we breathe violence and murder against people or animals or plants or any part of creation, we are persecuting God. Act three, conversion. So if conversion involves seeing differently, which our scripture today clearly states, 
then I am currently involved in a process of conversion. Because I am in the process of seeing that we are living in a time unlike any other in the recorded history of our planet. I am in the process of seeing clearly that the number one issue facing our world and the issue that we sidestep to our peril is the environment and climate and care of creation. Please, please let me assure you that my testimony this morning is not about politics. Politics cannot save us. Science cannot save us. Technology cannot save us. Elon Musk and all the money in the world cannot save us. Only God can save us. And I am beginning to see that aligning ourselves with God's ethic of creation is the only way left that we've got to move forward. You see, my brothers and sisters, I believe that God Almighty is the creator of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. And I believe that God loves God's creation all of it, water and sky and plants and animals and humans, loves all of creation desperately and madly and equally. And although God doesn't love us humans more than God loves zebras, God did give us, God gave humankind a special and a specific task to care for the whole creation that God loves so much. And I am beginning to see that we have failed at the one job that God gave us to do. And instead of caring for all of creation, Humankind has been working really, really hard at making a distinction between us, humans, and the rest of creation. Humanity has worked really hard at putting humanity at the center. I'll give you a hint. God belongs at the center. But we have worked really hard at putting humanity at the center, and then everything else is othered. All of creation has been othered. And once humanity achieved othering, everything that wasn't human, we didn't stop there. Because we continued to other each other. <laughs> and so we are now at the point where we have othered everything and everyone to the point where we are standing in the middle of a crisis that we might not be able to avert. Our only hope is our faith, our faith leading us to align our worldview with God's ethic of care for and valuing of all creation. Only by claiming and reclaiming an effort, an ethic that affirms the intrinsic value of all creation, which includes all people. <laughs> Only by reclaiming an ethic that affirms the intrinsic value of all creation can we move away from this human nature dualism 
that permits othering, that permits the othering of jaguars and butterflies, and then goes on to permit the othering of black bodies and brown bodies, goes on to permit the othering of women's bodies, of LGBTQ bodies. Did you read the opinion page this morning? Is Iowa really going to other the bodies of our children? Like we other the bodies of those who only want to escape war and violence so that their children can live? Like we other the bodies of those that simply want to continue ancient migratory patterns so they can go and worship? When and if we who are people of faith can reclaim an ethic of creation where the world in its entirety is actually acknowledged as being good like God says it is. Good in and of itself, not just good for our purposes, but good because God says it's good. Only then will we glimpse a new path forward, a path away from othering and division, a path to wholeness and peace and health and shalom, converted like St. Paul from violence to love. And I got to tell you, brothers and sisters, I feel extremely vulnerable standing up here telling you all that I am in the midst of a conversion, that I am seeing new, seeing differently. And I told Lindsay yesterday, I'm feeling really vulnerable. And she said, oh, Leanne, isn't that what faith is all about? <laughs> People of Plymouth, I, I know in my bones, I feel it in my gut, we are, all of us are standing, <coughs> standing on the edge of a growth spurt. And we are going to be growing deep. And that's going to be amazing, but it's going to involve being vulnerable. And it's going to include telling our stories of conversion, our stories of moving from status quo to encounter to conversion. And I can promise you, Pastor Jared wants to hear your stories. I can promise you, Pastor Jack wants to hear your stories, and Pastor Lindsay and Pastor Rushing, I want to hear your stories. We're on the edge of a growth spurt. Where have you seen status quo, encounter, conversion in your life? And where do you think you're going to see it? this year as we share and as we grow. Amen.